to Advent and worship at Westminster to our inclusive family of faith. We particularly welcome our visitors and those joining us on YouTube. and wait for Christ's coming. Light candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. Remembering the promises of God with prayer. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for peace. And we light this candle in joy. Rejoice, for our Lord is coming into the darkness of oppression's exile to lead us home. As we hear in Isaiah, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunts of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become wee reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Redeemer, you lead us from languishing in sorrow's shadows into laughter's joy over your abundant restoration. Thank you that you are coming for us to lead us home along your way, Jesus Christ. God Promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Well, one thing that brings me joy is seeing all these beautiful quilts and all the beautiful knitting that we have in the back made by people of our church. Isn't that really cool? Can you guys make quilts? Do you know how? No, it seems really impossible to me. So it seems like a joyful miracle. <clears throat> you got to do sewing. There are 50 quilts here this morning that our members, that's a good face, Asha, that's how I feel, that our members worked really hard to make. You've made a bag. That's awesome. Do you know where the quilts are going to go? We're going to donate them to people who don't have their own homes yet at the Salvation Army Center. And once they get their own homes, you know what they get to take with them? Quilt. Their own quilt. And then our shawls and hats. There's hats for a little baby. They go to a hospital. And some of our prayer shawls go to people who need prayer. 
And it's a wonderful gift. And I like to think that even though these people may feel a little sad and are hurting because life is hard, that these quilts and our knitting can bring them a moment of joy. So will you help me bless our quilts and knitting this morning? Okay, go find a quilt and put your hand on it. Our friends in the pews can do this too. If you have a beautiful piece of knitting or quilting near you, feel free to reach out and touch it or hold the person's hand next to you. There's lots in here. Yeah, so find one and put your hand on it. You guys are doing great. Feel how soft and pretty it is. Okay, and we're going to pray. Are we ready? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, as we place our hands on these quilts, we join the givers and the receivers, recognizing the unity of all your people in the body of Christ. We give thanks for the variety of gifts that compose these quilts and knitting, donations of fabric and yarn, faithful people who cut the squares, design the patterns, knit the stitches, sew the tops, iron the fabric, make backs and fillers, tie and stitch the bindings, and deliver the quilts. We give thanks for the fellowship of all who work together to make these quilts and knitted items, the laughter, the shared stories, the joy of crafting something with one's hand and heart for another, and the time to reflect and wonder about the recipient. We send these quilts and knitting as a sign of God's love and blessing for each person who receives one, trusting that their quilt will be a source of comfort and hope in the midst of transition, trusting that the shawls and hats will warm them not only on the outside but also in the heart as a symbol of Christ's love to those who suffer, a reminder that each recipient is a beloved child of God. We pray that these quilts will serve a useful purpose in the life of the recipient. May it be a step in recovering one's life and a message of care from someone they may never meet. We remember those who have received our quilts in the past and pray that their lives have returned to stability. Bless all who give and all who receive quilts, scarves, lap blankets, shawls, and mittens as we are sewn together in the unity of your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Elyon Adonai, age to age you're still the same by the power of the name. El
Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke 1, verses 46 through 55. Mary has just found out from the angel Gabriel that she is to be expecting a child. She runs to her cousin Elizabeth, who recognizes the Lord in her. And Mary sings this song. So listen to the word of the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked with favor on the lowliness of His servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy, according to the promise He made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to His descendants forever. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. This week, you might have seen in the news that we are remembering and celebrating the very full life of John Glenn as he was called home to the church triumphant. Some know John Glenn as an astronaut and the first American to orbit the earth. Others as a World War II and Korean War veteran. Still others know him as an Ohio senator. I'm happy to claim him as a Presbyterian ruling elder whose faith shaped his education and his work. As an astronaut, he was able to get a glimpse of God's creation that very few people do. After his second orbit in space at 77 years old, he described witnessing the might of God. Looking at the earth from this vantage point, looking at this kind of creation and to not believe in God, to me, is impossible. To see earth laid out like that only strengthens my beliefs. When John Glenn looked at the world, he saw the might and power of our God. He saw the proof of God's handiwork throughout the creation of the universe and all that is. That kind of might is what comes to my mind when we talk about our mighty God. What do you think about when you hear the name for the Messiah, Mighty God? When you think of someone who is mighty, who do you think of? Superman? Captain America? Wonder Woman? She-Ra? The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? In our Bible study this week, we talked about Mighty Mouse, an animated superhero with bulging mouse muscles and a cape. Does anyone remember Mighty Mouse's catchphrase? You want to sing it for me, Jill? Here I come to save the day. And he would introduce each episode by saying, and now the adventures of Mighty Mouse, starring the mightiest mouse in the universe, Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse would come and save the world from villainous cats and other major threats to our world order. In many ways, it was traditional superhero fare. A crisis would unfold that no one else could fix, and all of a sudden, here comes Mighty Mouse to save the day. Except this mighty and powerful Savior is a mouse of all things, a creature that most would dismiss as an insignificant nuisance. Mighty Mouse takes what people think is mighty and turns it upside down. Mighty Mouse redefined exactly what mighty is. Could mean. This morning we continue our Advent series on names for the Messiah, exploring the royal titles for Jesus Christ found in Isaiah 9. 
We've heard about the new king that the people were anticipating. The Savior Messiah who was to be the wonderful counselor, a perfect teacher who would enact new policies and plans for a peaceful regime. But in Isaiah's time, it wasn't enough for a king to be wise. He also had to be powerful and courageous. A warrior king, commander in chief, a mighty God. Dr. Walter Brueggemann, author of the Advent study we've been using, points out that the connotations around El Gabor, the mighty God in the Hebrew, have military connotations. It's a kind of might that means boldness, bravery, and valiance. For the ancient Israelites and Judeans, an effective king worked for the shalom of the whole realm, protecting them from any military threat, and also working for justice in social relations, as well as economic prosperity. In celebrating the new King Hezekiah, Isaiah claims that a son has been given to us, a child is born, and this child is a mighty God. Isaiah wasn't writing at Hezekiah's birth, but at his coronation. For the ancient Israelites and Judeans, they believed that the king's became sons of God at their coronation ceremony, that they now were divine carriers of power. A king then became more than just a mere man. A king was chosen and equipped by God to lead the people in wisdom and strength, to convey the divine power as they worked for justice and righteousness. But ultimately, all the kings of Judah and Israel failed. None of them were mighty enough to stop the Assyrians and Babylonians. None of the kings were, in fact, God. Mighty or otherwise. So Isaiah's expectations were added to the list of a long-awaited new king, the Messiah, the Anointed One, a king who would protect his people with might, justice, and righteousness, a king who would win all the battles, a king who could resist all evil. Our Gospel reading from Luke offers a few glimpses of hope for the Messiah, the Mighty God. After Mary receives the announcement from the angel Gabriel, she travels days and days to confide in her dear cousin Elizabeth, also surprisingly pregnant. Their meeting is one filled with joy and expectation and subversive power as they share their news and what this might mean, not just for them, but for the whole world. Mary bursts into song to give thanks to the Mighty One, describing what it means that the mighty God will enter the world through her. Her song echoes Hannah's song from so many years ago. Hannah, Samuel's mom, who also rejoiced at her unexpected pregnancy. Both of their songs describe a mighty God who doesn't only care for the mighty and powerful of the world. In fact, this mighty God seems very concerned with the lowly and the hungry and the needy and the ordinary. The mighty God that Mary sings of is not one concerned with violently overthrowing oppressive rulers, but a mighty God who works from the ground up, starting with the least likely. Our mighty God shows up to a girl who has no might, and turns her into a mighty mother who bears God into the world. Our mighty God puts a song in her heart and her voice as she envisions the future that her son will bring. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from the thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away already full. Our mighty God comes to earth not with a host of armies, not with a hunger for power, not to exploit or oppress. Like Mighty Mouse, our mighty God does not look like a traditional divine hero. Our mighty God comes to earth as a vulnerable, dependent, powerless baby boy, born without fanfare to an ordinary woman, 
singing her heart song about the joy in her soul. Our mighty God finds strength in weakness, power in the powerless, courage in vulnerability, a king in a manger. Our mighty God known as Jesus Christ goes on to find value in women and children and lepers and outcasts, in addition to the disciples and religious leaders. Our mighty God freely submits to a scandalous death on a cross. And our mighty God refuses to stay in the tomb, triumphing over sin and death. And we know that our mighty God could do it all on God's own. Our mighty God could have abandoned us after the first, second, hundredth, thousandth time we disobeyed. Our mighty God could have left the lowly downtrodden, let the hungry go without, favored the rich and the proud, forgotten Israel, and withheld mercy. That makes the incarnation, God made flesh, all the more amazing. God doesn't have to crown us and satisfy us as we hear in Psalm 103. God doesn't have to make us holy. And God didn't have to freely enter our world as one of us. And yet, God chooses us. God chooses to be one of us and to be for us freely and fully. God chooses Mary to bring Jesus into the world. And God chooses us to bear God into the world as well. As the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, God is not ashamed of the lowliness of human beings. God marches right in. He chooses people as His instruments and performs His wonders where one would least expect them. God is near to lowliness. He loves the lost, the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak, and the broken. Our mighty God embraces us as we are. For our mighty God is also our wonderful counselor, mighty and wise. And in God's infinite wisdom and might, God conquers something greater than the powers of Assyria and Babylon and Rome. Mighty God defeats sin and death so that we are not only forgiven, healed, and redeemed, but also crowned and satisfied. The Messiah as mighty God means that not only the powers of sin and death are weakened, but also that we are welcomed into the family of God. How can we watch and wait for this mighty God to show up once more? How can we prepare our hearts and our world for this mighty God to be born again? Where can we see might in a new way? Not exerting power over, but lifting up the lowly. Where can we see might not as taking what we want, but as feeding the hungry and showing mercy where it is not deserved. Moreover, if we are truly heirs with Christ, if we truly share in His calling and power as mighty God, how can we share that divine power to which we have been entrusted? How, we, how can we continue His work of forgiving, healing, redeeming, crowning, and satisfying? How can we work together to save the day, to lift each other up and make sure we all have enough to eat? Maybe, like Mary, we need to listen to that voice inside us that is growing and transforming our hearts from the inside. Maybe, like Mary, we need to sing a little more about all the joy our mighty God has brought us. Maybe, like Mary, we need to testify that the ways of this world are not the ways of the mighty God. Maybe, like Mary, we need to pray and listen for our role and our call in partnering with mighty God. Maybe, like Mary, we need to trust that our mighty God will equip us to handle the hard and unexpected calls. Maybe, like Mary, we need to recognize the ways that God's shalom 
needs to be born into this world. As we watch and wait for the Messiah, let us rejoice in the courage of Mary and all our ancestors in faith who show us the strength to praise and partner with mighty God. Let us celebrate that our mighty God who defeats sin and death cares about each one of us. And let us give thanks to God for a child has been born for us, a son given to us, and he shall be called Mighty God. Amen. Amen.